It is Fed Decision Day, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Your equity market on the S&P just about positive. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, Chair Powell preparing to pause following one last hike, with regional bank stocks remaining under pressure and the U.S. labor market still looking resilient. We begin with the big issue, the Fed's dilemma. We have the Federal Reserve today, obviously. This will be the last rate hike of the cycle. It's what happens next. They have said that they're very data dependent. You can't be overly data dependent. The data that the Fed is looking at is mostly coincident and lagging and your policy tools operate with lags going forward. The Fed has its credibility at stake here. How do you bring down inflation, maintain economic activity, or at least minimize damage to economic activity, and maintain financial stability? If they're viewed as hiking into more banking failures, right, this is putting more pressure on the banking sector. They're now moving towards a pause. But really, enemy number one here is still the inflation picture. The Fed's job is not done. And it gets really complicated Joining us now to discuss what's complicated, Man Your Life's Francis Donald alongside Morgan Stanley's Matt Hornback. Francis, first to you. Are monetary policy objectives in conflict with financial stability? Uh, absolutely, because we're in an environment where price stability and inflation is being driven by a larger set of factors that are not all domestically focused. And in this environment where you can't just bring down demand and fix all of inflation, you're going to come up against more challenges. And this is exactly what we're seeing now. And this is a central bank, in fact, many central banks globally, that's going to have to make some tough decisions. There is no way that the Federal Reserve is not looking at the set of problems that they have right now and getting very nervous about where they're going to have to put their chips. So, Matt, with that in mind, how many banks need to fail before we stop calling this idiosyncratic? Oh, well, John, I, I, my sense is we're, we're, past, we're past that point at, at, at this juncture. Um, you know, idiosyncratic sounds a lot like transitory. Sounds a lot like contained, um, to, to pick a couple of choice words from the Fed's history. Um, you know, look, I, I think that ultimately financial stability is a precondition to the Fed uh, achieving its goals. And if, in fact, if you look through the Fed's website, which, you know, one might do on occasion, uh, you'll see reference to that fact that financial stability is paramount. Uh, in when the Fed is trying to achieve its its objectives of maximum employment and stable prices. Silvergate, SVB, Signature, First Republic, throwing Credit Suisse. The list is long. Let's hope it's not growing. Some people fear it will be. Francis, you're now thinking a material growth slowdown for the U.S. economy. Can you put some numbers on that? Just give me an idea of, A, what's indicating that material growth slowdown to you, and B, what you think it's going to look like. Everything is indicating a material growth slowdown and most likely a recession centered around Q3. And when I talk about material, it's less about the depth and more about how prolonged this weak growth is going to be. And that's the really big challenge from an investment standpoint is a garden variety recession. We know how to react, behave and invest in that type of environment. But a slow growth, persistent slow growth environment, particularly when inflation is maybe still hovering around 3%, that's stagflation and every one of our models tells us that that environment is much worse for risk assets than a typical garden variety recession. This is what concerns me. And the biggest indicator we have to watch, John, is those credit channels. The Fed will have seen that senior loan officer survey. We get it on Monday. I'm looking today for any sort of indication from Chair Powell about what's contained in that, because that will be key to the depth of the recession that we're heading into later this year. This is a really important point, Matt, so let's build on it. Does this have the potential to turn into a broad credit crunch from your perspective? And ultimately, how do we position for that accordingly? Well, well John, I mean, clearly there's risks uh, that point in that direction, uh, you know, whether or not this ends up being a financial crisis of the sort that we encountered in 2008, I think is just too soon to say. But, but I, I would I would argue that the the risks are that we have something that's not quite as severe 
uh, as what we went through in, in 2008. Nevertheless, the, you know, the, we're in a particular moment in time here, John, where you know, the risks are particularly heightened and acute. And, and so we think that this is an environment where investors should be positioned defensively, uh, owning safe haven government bonds, uh, owning the safe haven U.S. dollar. In this moment in time where risks are still pointing in a nonlinear direction, uh, we think it's best to be positioned defensively, John. So, Matt, let's talk about some levels. Ten year right now, 340. What are you and the team looking for? Well, by the end of the year, John, we, we think that uh, interest rate will be closer to 3%. Uh, so we have sympathy with comments from other uh, guests that you've had on where we do think that the curve will be steeper than it is today, uh, the 10-year yield being close to 3% and the two-year yield also being a, a similar level. So your 10-year right now, negative 56 basis points. We are about 25 minutes away from the opening bell. Equity futures just about positive on the S&P, positive by 0.1%. 2 p.m. Eastern time. We get that call from the Federal Reserve. 30 minutes later, you get the news conference in that presser. Mike McKee down in D.C. with a preview. Morning, Mike. Good morning, John. And remember, we have had disparate market reactions to the statement and then when Jay Powell has his news conference. So we could see some volatility this afternoon because there are some big questions ahead of the Fed, as you've been talking about. The first, of course, is are they one and done? Is this it for them? Uh, do they suggest that there may be more to come if inflation doesn't come down? Uh, the economy, recession or unemployment? Uh, the Fed's uh, minutes of their last meeting show the staff forecast a recession. Is it going to be the Fed's official forecast? Banks, more to come, of course. We're watching all of the uh, banks who are in trouble over the last couple of days. And what does Jay Powell say about lending standards? Have they gone up? And then there will be questions about the debt ceiling. Probably Powell is going to dodge those and say, we are the Treasury's fiscal agent, but we're not going to comment. They just need to raise the debt ceiling. The change to watch at 2 p.m. in the statement, the idea that uh, the committee anticipates some additional policy firming may be appropriate was in the last statement. Does that change maybe to what they did in 2006? The extent and timing of any additional firming that may be needed to address these risks will depend on the evolution of the outlook. Or do they just leave the language that they have, figuring that encompasses it as well? And then how do you trade if that's what you get? Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Looking forward to your coverage a little bit later. It has been absolutely amazing. SVB failed, other banks too. The Fed hiked rates. FRC has gone under. The Fed is set to hike interest rates. Francis Donald, the Fed is going to hike interest rates even with banks breaking, banks failing. I want to think a little bit further forward from here. When they say pause, if they do indeed say pause later on in this news conference, will the market here cut? It depends how they qualify it. And this is exactly how we need to be thinking about it, John, because whether or not the Fed goes another one or two times is frankly not as material as how long they're going to pause for and what the window is for them to start cutting. And my big concern is not that the Fed you know, hikes another several times, but that they are slow when they need to be cutting probably later this year into next year. They're going to be worried about credibility. It seems like they're very focused on lagging indicators. And if they wait for every indicator that they say is important to be back in its range, they are going to wait too long. That is the biggest risk in this environment is that we have to suffer through a recession with no policy easing for much longer than we have historically. So I'm looking for some indication from the central banks today of whether or not they're open to uh, you know, a different decision-making function or whether or not Chair Powell says, I cannot let the market have the belief of easing. It will create stimulus just via markets and hold back from that sort of narrative. It's a very difficult position for a central bank to be in. What's your view right now, Francis, based on what you've heard from them? Do you think the bar is higher or lower for hikes versus cuts? Is the bar higher for hikes or higher for cuts? The bar is very high for cuts at this juncture with the data that we currently have. This is the information that's been given to us. And I, I do believe that they're going to lag on those cuts much longer than they should. And we probably will have to wait until much later in 2023 or into 2024. That means the market's going to have to back up on some of those cut expectations. That's going to be challenging for the housing market, which is already anticipating some stabiliz stabilization in rates. Uh, and I, I think we're in for a little bit of a repricing here. It's going to be uncomfortable comfortable for markets and also for the real economy. That's where the tension is in the market right now. Ellen Zetner, Matt Hornback, your colleague, said they expect, or rather you guys expect, the Fed to communicate a conditional pause. My question would be, Matt, conditional on what? 
Well, well, John, I think it's conditional on the data as the Fed's policy has been up until this point. I, I do think that the data has been particularly lagging, uh, a, a, you know, economic activity and the lags with which their monetary policy operates. So I, I do think the data has been more backward looking. But, you know, even in March, John, the Fed started to incorporate some forward looking elements into their policy materials. I, when I looked at the dot plot from the March meeting, the message that I walked away with was that the way in which the Fed is going to balance a backward looking inflation rate and a forward looking credit tightening is by hiking less and cutting later. That's where I think they are going to focus. Hike less, cut later. In terms of what does the market pay attention to, the market can only pay attention to what's right in front of its face, John, which is yeah. hike less. Hike less. I hear you, Matt. Matt Hornback of Morgan Stanley alongside Francis Donald of Manulife. Also in that dot plot. No dot plot today, remember, no projections. But in the last round of projections from the Fed, massive range of the Federal Reserve still for next year in the dot plot. And you just wonder if that leads to any dissent either way, in either direction, a little bit later on. Mike McKee talked about the language in the statement last time around. That line, the committee anticipates that some additional policy firming may be appropriate. That's going to be the paragraph, the line a lot of people focus on when this decision drops a little bit later. In the equity market at the moment, about 19 minutes away from the open and bow, we're positive, a little more than 0.1%. With some stocks to watch, here's Abby. Good morning, John. And let's check in on those regional banks because we've had tremendous pre market volatility with PacWest down as much as 10%, more than 10% earlier than both of these banks. Higher, Western Alliance up more than 1% earlier. Now both down slightly uh, as we continue to digest the. Uh, falling of First Republic and plus ahead of that Fed um, meeting later today. As for earnings movers, AMD down sharply and they provided a mixed quarter plus a so-so outlook based on big PC slowdown has the stock down 7%. Starbucks down 4.6% a great quarter but the outlook was simply held not enough for investors. And then CVS Health well off of its lows. Uh, they put up an OK quarter but they cut the outlook on acquisition costs. One common denominator there John we have the outlooks disappointing that has these stocks down. Abby thanks for that more from Abigail a little bit later in the hour. Coming up, pressure building on Fed Chair Jay Powell. I actually think the banking situation may well be more serious than we currently understand it. I would prefer to do a, a what's called the hawkish pause, not raise. It's not just former Fed officials. Capitol Hill urging the Fed to pause as well. More on that conversation up next. I actually think the banking situation may well be more serious than we currently understand it. We're in the early stages, not the late stages of this banking situation. We've just seen the first phase of this, which is the asset liability mismatch, which is sort of the most obvious issue. But the credit issues are about to start. The pain might just be getting started. That was the take from former Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan. Pressure building on the Federal Reserve to hit pause. Washington joining the chorus. Ten members of Congress penning a letter to Chair Powell ahead of decision day led by Senator Warren. This is what they had to say. We strongly urge you to respect the Fed's dual mandate. Pause your rate hikes and avoid engineering a recession that destroys jobs and crushes small businesses. One of the sponsors of that letter doubling down on their ask. I don't understand why we wouldn't just pause now. If, if you take a potential or perhaps slow ongoing banking crisis and place that on top of a slowing economy, I have to say I am very concerned of the prospect of future rate increases. Joining us now is Anne-Marie down in Washington, D.C. AMH, was that an audition for one of the open seats on the Fed board? <laughs> well, not just an audition for one of the open seats shot down the Fed board, but certainly what you see here is Democratic lawmakers in the Senate. That individual led the charge to sign this letter, Brendan Boyle, in the House to this, uh, penned this letter to Jay Powell, asking him to hit pause. Their concerns about what this could mean for a potential Russian, uh, recession in the United States, a tightening of credit conditions, and also the fact that we just had a bank failure this week. 
And their concern is why would you raise rates at the time when you have a bank failure, the fourth in the United States, at a time when the underlying issue for a lot of these banks is they didn't hedge for higher, higher interest rates. So a lot of pressure is building on the Fed chair today, Jonathan. And this is just one of the potential questions he's going to be asked, right? Because there's a lot of issues right now in Washington that journalists want to hear what the Fed chair has to talk about, not just the failed banks, not just higher interest rates, what's this need for potentially a recession or the jobs market, but also what does this mean for the debt ceiling? Well, precisely. Anne-Marie, a little bit later, no doubt about it. They're talking about Chairman Powell's business. Chairman Powell's going to be asked about their business. Why are we talking about yep. their views on Fed policy and not their views on the debt ceiling? Well, obviously, there's growing concerns from their constituents, right? Um, first, it was higher inflation. Now, there's worries about if people are going to uh, lose their jobs. And also, of course, regional planks, regional banks pay a huge issue with these individuals. But uh, Powell will probably flip it right back to them this afternoon. It's a great point because what he is going to say, that is Congress's job to lift the debt ceiling. It is Congress's job to make sure Treasury is going to have sufficient funds to pay our past bills. And I imagine he's going to want to keep it there and make sure he's not getting involved in the politics. Because the politics right now, Jonathan, are very heated going into that meeting next week with congressional leadership and the president. MH, thank you. Down in Washington, D.C. Appreciate it. Let's return back to those comments from Robert Kaplan, the former Dallas Fed president, who said this. I actually think the banking situation may well be more serious than we currently understand. He went on to say, essentially, that what we've experienced so far is the rate shock going through the banking sector. What we haven't experienced is the credit phase. Francis Donald, when you think about the credit phase, what do you think that might look like off the back of all of this? This is my number one concern because one of the best leading indicators for growth is the credit channel. And it's especially important for small businesses in the United States who, by the way, have been the disproportional creating a creator of jobs since 2020. So we know that when you experience any form of fragility in the banking sector, we do see credit channels seize up. They were already declining before we ran into this banking system. So this is why credit data is becoming the most important data to watch watch because yes, it will flow through into growth, which will flow into inflation. So if we want to really target where inflation is going to be, this credit data becomes the most important component. And it's difficult when we look at what we already knew, even before we knew it was going to get worse, to say that this is anything but a very sizable leading indicator of a slowdown slash recession and that it is going to weigh on inflation moving forward. And, and this is why, as we continue to see a Fed that appears to want to see actualized inflation fall, we know that they are going to be lagging and probably much more lagging than they have been historically. Matt, we have had a rate shock. Do you see the ingredients for a credit shock? Oh, John, I, I think the, the certainly the ingredients are there. I mean, our banking analysts are expecting uh, loan growth to slow materially over the next 12 months or so. So we definitely see the ingredients. And I think the point was well made that a lot of this was happening even before we started to lose regional banks in the country. So the impulse is almost certainly going to get worse. And we actually saw evidence of this already. I don't think you have to wait for the senior loan officer to survey to come out. We already saw evidence of this in the Beige Book. Now, the Beige Book is not exactly the most widely read publication that the Fed produces. But in this particular instance, <laughs> it's worth a read. We are starting to see signs that credit standards are being tightened even further in the wake of the Silicon Valley Bank uh, uh, event. Good luck trying to make the Beige Book great again. But I'm with you, Matt. It's an important read. I just wonder how compatible this conversation is, Francis, with 2% GDP growth and 3.5% unemployment. For a lot of people listening, clearly it's not. No, it, it's not. And this is why you have so many economists coming on this show and on Bloomberg hammering home the same point over and over again. We have leading indicators, which are all flashing red, and many of them are not just consistent with recessions, but severe recessions. You've got coincident indicators, which are sort of in the yellow zone. And then you have the lagging indicators. And one of the most lagging indicators is inflation. Another one is jobs. So if we wait for those to fall, we are too late. And this is the big dissonance that's occurring right now is we're really tr conflating these lagging indicators with these leading ones. And I know it's a simple point, but what we're experiencing right now is not out of tradition. It is in many ways very common 
to see the falling dominoes as they have fallen. The question now is more about severity of those declines. And this is why the credit and banking story is really clutch. It's not about telling us whether we will hit a recession or not. It's telling us the depth of the recession ahead. Essentially, we've spent the last 20 minutes suggesting that maybe or at least questioning whether the Federal Reserve has its head in the sand. But Matt, when you look at the forecast, they are forecasting 4.5% unemployment by year end. We're at 3.5 right now. That's 100 basis points higher. Matt, are we saying that is too optimistic still, 4.5% year end? Well, John, I mean, that's roughly in line with where our economists are. So I wouldn't um, necessarily describe that as out of line. But what we know about previous episodes where the unemployment rate has start, started to go up is that it never stops on a dime. You know, it always overshoots. And I think that's the risk that the Fed takes on board uh, when they are, you know, give people an incentive to pull their money out of the banking system and put it into a money market fund that has access to the safest asset on the planet, which is what the Fed is providing on its balance sheet. So I think, you know, with the rate hike tomorrow or today, rather, you know, that's increasing the incentive on the margin for people to seek safety in a money market fund as opposed to a bank account. And that's the problem. And we're going to talk about that from the banking perspective in about 10 minutes' time with an analyst from CFRA. I'm looking forward to that conversation. How hopeful is this, Francis, that unemployment goes to 4.5, stays there, inches up to 4.6 next year, 4.6 again the year after, which are essentially the Fed projections last time around? Well, I said that much of what we're seeing right now is very traditional from the recession standpoint. Housing goes, manufacturing goes, and employment is later. But there may be two factors at play here that are different in this coming recessionary environment. And one of them is the potential that the unemployment rate rises less than it has historically. And that's because there is a psychology of labor shortage, labor hoarding. A lot of these people were very difficult to get into their seats and roles. So we may see the unemployment rise happen later or to a lesser extent than what we've seen historically. But at the same time, that complicates the Fed's job. They have a dual mandate. And if yep. they're focused literally on the unemployment rate and inflation, we may see them again. I'm just going to say it over and over again. Go later and avoid cutting. On repeat, Francis, we appreciate it. Francis Donald, Matt Hornback, to the two of you, thank you. On this Fed Decision Day, coming up the morning calls and later, another volatile day for the regionals. We'll get the view from CFRA's Alexander Yoakum plus Troy Gajewski of FS Investments. Five minutes away from the opening bell. Equity's just about positive. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Bernstein upgrading Marriott to outperform, seeing signs of resilient pricing power and strengthening travel trends. Bank of America downgrading AMD to neutral, expecting limited upside after the chipmaker delivered a tepid outlook. And finally, Susquehanna upgrading Uber to positive, highlighted the company's improving profitability and disciplined cost controls. Coming up, regional bank stocks remain under pressure. That conversation up next with CFRA's Alexander Yoakum and Troy Gajewski of FS Investments. You're opening bell. Up next. Twenty-three seconds away from the up and about this Wednesday morning. Good morning on this Fed decision day. Your equity market positive by 0.1 percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq positive by 0.13 percent. Also struggling so far this week to put together a day of gains on the S&P 500. There's your open and bow switch on the board and get to the bond market. Yield shaping up as follows on a 10-year down three basis points today. Monday up more than 10 basis points. Tuesday down more than 10 basis points. Monday it was prices paid on the ISM and a ton of bank issues or rather corporate issuance coming from a ton of companies pushing yields higher. On Tuesday, it was about banking stress dragging yields back lower. In the FX market, the euro pretty much unchanged through most of this morning, now positive four-tenths of 1% at 110.40 on euro dollar. And keep an eye on crude. Crude with a break of 70 for the first time since March earlier on in the session. 69.30 were negative there by 3%. You'll notice at the Nasdaq, this is one to watch, the Committee to Protect Journalists ringing the opening bell at the Nasdaq on World Press Freedom Day, calling on the international community to demand the release of the hundreds of journalists unjustly imprisoned worldwide. That's a message we can all get behind. Let's get to the broader market about 50 seconds into the session. We are positive by 0.1% on the S&P. One sector to watch at the open regional banks, a volatile morning for these names after a rough day of double-digit losses. 
just yesterday. Kelly Lines has more. Hi, Kelly. Yeah, John, it doesn't look like market confidence in these names has magically returned this morning. As you said, yesterday was incredibly painful. PacWest was down 28% in the Tuesday session. Western Alliance was down 15%. And this morning, a rebound very hard to find. PacWest at the moment down about 3%. And while Western Alliance is fractionally positive at the moment, it has been fluctuating between gains and losses all session. The regional banks as a whole, as measured by the uh, regional banks ETF, up about 7 tenths of 1%. But we'll have to see how it goes and whether or not it sticks. Because the thing is, John, there's not necessarily any new news for these regional banking names other than the news of Monday, which is that First Republic was taken over by regulators and then handed off to J.P. Morgan. But there remains an open question as to whether there are other shoes that have yet to drop. We still have massive questions around the idea of deposits fleeing to either too big to fail players or just higher uh, yielding products. There's also questions around what the regulatory and policy picture is going to look like. And there still is that issue of the asset liability mismatch and the pain of unrealized losses of higher interest rates, which are likely to get even higher when the Fed makes its decision today. Put it all together, John, and it still looks like confidence in the sector is very shaky, and that is perhaps exemplified best by the former Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan, who told Bloomberg last night that this crisis is in its early stages, not the late ones. We're going to stand those names for you through the opening bell over the next 10 minutes or so. In fact, through most of today, PAC West, Western Alliance absolutely slammed yesterday, trying to cover this morning, recover this morning by 1.6% on the likes of PAC West. Western Alliance, negative 1.8%. Katie, thank you. If you want to move, Estee Lauder right now sinking by more than 20% around the opening bow. Estee Lauder cutting the forecast going out from here, the outlook on a slow travel recovery in China of all places. So that's a surprise. That stock is negative right now. That stock is down on my screen. Let's get it up for you. We are down by 19% there. Let's turn to earnings. Starbucks keeping its cautious full year guidance. That outlook not sitting well with the street. Wells Fargo analysts saying it, quote, screams conservative. Abby has more. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. And this is the worst day for Starbucks of the year going back to October of last year. And what's amazing about it, they put up a blowout quarter, 2Q, second quarter comps uh, coming in up 11%. The estimate had been up 7.3%, but it has everything to do with the outlook. Now, they didn't cut it, so this is interesting. They held it, but investors and analysts, as you were just mentioning, saying that this is conservative, that growth is likely uh, to slow going forward. So relative to the numbers, they did put up 74 cents in adjusted earnings. That was 14 percent better. Uh, revenues of $8.72 billion uh, beat by 3.5 percent. China upside, unlike uh, Estee Lauder. But just reiterating that guidance, it's not enough, especially given the fact, John, that this stock is up more than 60 percent out of the October lows for that kind of performance over the last six months or so. Investors want more. They want guidance raised, which would suggest that the big beat we saw in the second quarter, that that kind of growth is going to continue, that the company's confident in it. Instead, we have uh, basically holding the growth. Let's see. But this stock, again, worst day of the year for Starbucks. Abby, thank you. Here's another name. This was expected by a lot of people. AMD's ongoing PC slowdown weighing on its sales forecast. The CFO shifting attention to the second half, saying this. We remain confident in our growth in the second half of the year as the PC and server markets strengthen. Ed Ludlow in San Francisco has more. Morning, Ed. Good morning, John. The 6% drop in AMD is the steepest since October. For the second quarter, they're forecasting sales of $5.3 billion plus or minus $300 million. I think the street was looking for the higher end of that at 5.5 billion dollars in the quarter gone the data center business is flat but as you said we saw the pc slump we're expecting a drop of 69 percent on the pc business if there was a bright spot gaming revenues held up in the quarter just gone and looking forward amd is saying that margins will be around 50 percent in that second quarter in line with what analysts were looking for the narrative is around a recovery in the second half of this year, although it's interesting to look at uh, AMD's forecast for PC shipments this year, which they say will be 260 million units globally. Last week, Intel has said 270 million units globally. So there's a small discrepancy between the two names. But yeah, this is definitely a market that's under pressure uh, and AMD is feeling it. Ed, we'll talk about a market that's under pressure right now. It's the financials over the last few weeks. Ed, thank you. Want to turn back to the banks, obviously. Wolf Research, Dan Grenning's shares of Comerica to peer perform, saying this. At a time when the regulatory environment is likely to become more stringent following several recent regional bank failures, we believe Comerica is likely to operate in capital accretion mode and should constrain Comerica's absolute upside potential 
over the coming quarters. And this is the problem. What's the profit outlook for some of these names? CFRA's Alexander Yoakum weighing in on the turmoil, saying this. The recent regional bank failures will have a negative impact on future earnings for the banking industry. We estimate the cost of replenishing the deposit insurance fund could translate to a 14% hit to the banking industry's earnings over just one year. Alex, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Alexander, great to have you with us on the show. I've been meaning to catch up with you for a while. You've made this really simple to understand in recent comments, and if you'll allow me, I want to share it with our audience. You said this, more deposit outflows lead to less lending, more expensive funding costs, and thus less profitability. And you went on to say, the fact that the news is talking about banks so much is leading more people to realise their bank deposits are not paying much, which leads me to ask this question. Alex, this regional banking model, is this a viable business with interest rates of 5%? Yeah, it's very difficult, uh, especially the bank you mentioned, uh, Comerica. Um, you know, that's a bank that has almost half of their deposits in non-interest bearing accounts. And like I said, you know, with, with banks being talked about so much, um, you know, people don't want 0% on their accounts right now. They're likely to move their deposits. The problem for banks is, you know, their their assets aren't necessarily repricing higher, so they can't pay, you know, three, four, five percent on their deposits. So it is a very uh, difficult position right now uh, for for banks. The good thing is they generally do still have excess deposits despite the outflows. But where the problem is when they have significant outflows, like Comerica, like um, uh, PacWest, you know, companies like that, that's where the problem really can, you know, get exaggerated. If they're going to struggle with rates of 5%, is there a solution outside of just cutting interest rates? Yeah, uh, there isn't necessarily a, uh, a clear solution uh, there. You know, they can increase the rate they pay on deposits to try to, you know, get as many as possible uh, to stay. Uh, but there isn't necessarily a clear solution. And I think that's one of the reasons, reasons why banks are trading at such depressed multiples. What did you think yesterday was? Some people called this some kind of speculative attack that the shorts just moved from First Republic and piled into the likes of PacWest, piled into Western Alliance. Alexander, what did you think this was? Yeah, I think there was a little bit of that. Um, so First Republic, over 30% of their shares uh, were shorted. Um, obviously, obviously a successful short. Um, in general, uh, pretty much all regional banks have not recovered very well. Uh, so there's been a lot of profitability for shorts. If you look at the, uh, the worst performing names like America, like PacWest, like Western Alliance, their short interest has tripled. Um, and then, you know, First Republic went down Monday morning and basically right after that, you started to see the sell off. So it's almost like the shorts switched uh, to other regional banks. Uh, but uh, yesterday, I really think there was just a fear for everything. People were looking at, you know, which banks have high commercial real estate exposure, which banks have high levels of um, uninsured deposits, which banks are highly concentrated. Uh, the three banks that went down, including uh, PacWest and then Western Alliance, all five of those, they all have over 50% of their deposits in a single state. Uh, so when there's fear, um, if all your clients are in the same place and they're talking to each other, that can kind of spiral and people might take their deposits out just because they get nervous. Are you worried this gets worse before it gets better? Do you think more banks fall from here? So it's, it's definitely difficult to say. Um, unfortunately, it is a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, so if people had actually listened to, uh, to Jamie and Diamond um, on Monday, I do think that there probably wouldn't have been any more failures. But if we do see significant sell-offs in bank stocks, I think it could result in more deposit outflows. You know, interestingly, most of these banks actually said that they saw deposit inflows in yeah. April, or at least their deposits were stable. But if the stock is falling 20% and you still have deposits in that bank um, and you can get a higher interest rate somewhere else, you know, there's not really any downside to take out your deposits. Uh, so it, it, it does sort of make sense, uh, you know, if you, if you get nervous. Alex, if it's not just about return off capital, it's also about return on capital. Does the FDIC coming out and scrapping the upper limit, does that change anything? Um, I could say it, it, it might uh, because, you know, the three banks that went down, they all did have very high leveled levels of uninsured deposits. It, deposits. The, the average in the banking industry is about 50%, and Silicon Valley Bank uh, had 95% uninsured, Signature Bank 90%, and First Republic almost 70%. Um, so if, if they did increase um, that number, I actually do think it could potentially help out. Hey, Alex, appreciate it. Let's catch up soon. Alexander Yoakum yeah. there of CFRA on some of the regionals. What a mess it's been. Troy Gajewski of FS Investments telling investors to, quote, sell risk. As we watch equities make new lows, the next three to nine months and the economy commence a recession starting sometime in Q3. Troy joins us right now.
for a conversation about this market. Troy, I assume you heard some of that. What do you make of it? What's the circuit breaker to end this mess? Yeah, so look, the regional banks are in a tough position, particularly the mid-sized ones, because, of course, they're going to face more regulation. Obviously, if you have net interest margins that are not nearly as positive as they were you know, as recently as six months ago, uh, and then you have had some of the outflows, uh, particularly the Fed's reverse repo and money markets, it just makes for a very tough business case for earnings. Um, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, when you look forward, this will more than likely be the Fed's last hike unless PCE comes hot again, and then they'll do one more. Behind the scenes, they continue to drain the balance sheet. And the trouble for broader markets continues to be the fact that valuations for the S&P are back up to 18.9 times this year's earnings, which is really only 10% below the multiple they were coming into 21 before the Fed hiked dramatically and went on the most aggressive balance sheet draining. So, you know, from our perspective, you want to lean into strategies that have lower risk, uh, mid to high single digit returns. Uh, don't be a hero. Certainly don't chase this bear market rally. And then make sure in your asset allocation, you are prepared for material downside in equities over the next six, nine, 12 months. Um, if you're not, uh, then you're gonna, unfortunately, the math's pretty straightforward. If you lose 10, you need to make 11. If you lose 20, you need to make 25. And so yeah. what's so interesting to us, John, is you know, alternatives were a great use case for a place in fixed income, really from 17 through this year, they still are. But it's almost more critical to embrace them to protect you from further downside risk and equities at this point of a cycle. I want to pick up on the equity call just for a moment. Mm -hmm. One further question. Troy, yep. when you look at what happened in March, banks failed, the equity market rallied. Going through April into May, First Republic went under, the equity market rallied. When you're looking for material downside at the index level, what are you talking about? Back to 3,800, back to the lows of October? What are you thinking? Yeah, so from our perspective, we, we would assume that multiples have bottomed at 15.75 in October, uh, which is slightly above 2002 bear market bottom in the 02 to 07 uh, bull market. Uh, so let's assume multiples have bottomed. We, we retrace multiples now from, so it's called 18.819 to 16 to 17. Um, and then as we enter a mild recession, knock on wood, fortunately mild, instead of earnings growing by 10%, they contract by 10%. And that gets you right to that 32 to 3,400. So that's, you know, so let's call it somewhere between 15 and 25% downside from here, um, which would put the total peak to trough of this bear market, you know, in the high 20s, low 30s. So not nearly as bad as 2002 or the global financial crisis, but significantly worse than 2011. So that's, that's the framework we've, we've always been using, or all, I should say over the last six, nine months. And you know, remember the thing to, that people forget is really up until the economy started to weaken, um, and now you're starting to see uh, cracking in the labor market. Last year was all about tightening. Um, we still have some tightening to go, and, and the next 12 months' big risk to equities is recession, and instead of earnings growing, contracting. Um, so the good news from an asset allocation standpoint is you you have much less downside in fixed income. The bad news is you're in for another round of pain in broader equity markets. Yep. Troy, you're going to be sticking with us. Troy Gajewski of FS Investments, just looking at the scores right now, about 14 minutes into the session, the S&P positive by 0.2%. The two names we've all been looking at over the last 24 hours, they're positive too. Pack West up more than 7%. Western Alliance up by close to 5 Coming up, more data still to come ahead of that Fed decision. What we're going to get today is a cautious hike from the Fed. They're going to open up some optionality, we think, for the next move to be a hike or a hold. That conversation next. This is Bloomberg's The Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Alan Schwartz. Guggenheim Capital Chairman and Managing Partner. That conversation coming up at 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. What we're going to get today is a cautious hike from the Fed. They're going to open up some optionality, we think, for the next move to be a hike or a hold. And that's what the market's going to hear today. It's going to hear a Fed that doesn't know if the next move is going to be a hike or a hold, but probably that the onus is on the data to now disprove the hold, because that's the base case. Let's talk about the data. Mike McKee has more. Morning, Mike. 
Yeah, morning, John. A couple of numbers just out now. The S&P Global Services PMI and the Composite. Services a tick down 53.6 from 53.7. And the same story for Composite, 53.4 for 53.5. First of all, uh, not much change. Those could be just statistical noise. And second of all, they don't really influence the Fed very much. However, at 10 o'clock, we do get the ISM Services Index. And that could be something that the Fed does care about today as they think about what happens next, because, of course, it's going to show us whether or not there's continuing growth in both employment and in prices in the services industry. We saw a big number in the ADP this morning of uh, 225,000, roughly, for service industry job creation. And if we get that kind of indication from the ISM services number, it might make the Fed a little nervous. The prices paid component of the manufacturing ISM on Monday spooked this bond market, made people nervous, that's for sure. The rebound there. Mike, thank you. The ISM top of the hour. Alex Steele, Guy Johnson breaking that one down for you. A little bit later, about 10, 11 minutes away. Just enough time to get into it with Troy Gajewski of FS Investments back with us for a final word. Troy, let's just start with the Fed and then we'll shift to some final trades. What are you looking for from Chairman Powell later? Yeah, certainly a cautious hike, right, where they're going on more. They're going to be very data dependent from there, which is the right policy at this point, right? Because inflation is still simmering. It's metastasized to labor and services. They got to get that right. But at the same time, they don't want to hike to the point where we have a hard, hard landing. So that's the expectation for the Fed, a very cautious hike. Five and hold for how long? Yeah, so five, five to five and a quarter, right? Hold. We think at least nine months, possibly 18. Um, and that's really the biggest disconnect in pricing right now. Is possibly that, 18, you know, Troy. Possibly it, a year it, and a half. It's possible, right? It, we don't think it's likely. But if the labor market remains this resilient, even though it has been signs of cracking, and uh, we somehow magically avoid recession despite a weakening labor market, then they could be on hold for that long. Because if you look at the trajectory of PCE, it's much easier to go from six to four than four to three and three to two. Man, that's going to take well, a while. Troy, what do you think this banking industry is going to look like if we have to hold rates of five for the next 18 months? Well, look, the banking industry, uh, other than, you know, the more fragile regionals, the system as a whole is in very good shape. I mean, we still have over three trillion of excess reserves. Even after accounting for the tremendous book value destruction from asset liability mismatching or duration mismatching, you still have more than 50% tier one capital than we had uh, going into the GFC, even after accounting for that. So the system is strong. Weakest links have broken, um, and there more than likely will be a few more to go. But we're not going to have the second, third, and fourth uh, largest bank failures in history happening again the next 12 months. You'll have some smaller banks that go, but certainly nothing systemically important. Well, we had the second biggest in March, and then it yep. was taken over by the second biggest in April. That's which right. Was First Republic. Troy, final word, investment ideas. Yep. What are you advocating for right now to clients? Yeah, so look, it, depending on the strategy, it, you, you want to take advantage of some of this cutback in lending in the banking system. Private credit looks incredibly attractive, particularly senior secured commercial real estate. In more liquid strategies, you know, focusing on interest-only strips that benefit from a decline in home prices. Our favorite way to play a, a gradual normalization in inflation, like we just discussed before, is uh, through yield curve steepeners, where you're not taking directional risk. Um, you're not speculating on Fed direction. You're just saying that as inflation comes down over time, it's natural that the curve, as it already has, will move from 100 basis points inverted to 75 basis points to 50 and ultimately steepen up. Um, and, and so those are some of the ways to take advantage of what's going on in markets today and, and stay in that northwest quadrant. Right, That's so important from an asset allocation standpoint to make sure that you're not exposing yourself to undue risk and can still grind out a mid to high single digit return. And the last thing I'd say what's so fascinating about alternative strategies broadly now is the income component to returns is materially higher, particularly for those that park a large portion of the cash uh, or, or uh, net, net asset value in cash and are also leaning into cash flow generative strategies, whether it's an IOs, structured credit, or long short credit and high yield. So yeah. still lots to do for the industry. Hey, Troy, good to catch up. Thank you. Equity's doing better yeah. here, up 0.3%. The regional bank's doing better too. Your trading diary, up next.
Let's call it 26 minutes into the session. Equities up positive by 0.4%. Let's get you the trading diary coming up at the top of the hour. We're going to get the ISM 2 p.m. Eastern time. It's on to the Fed decision. Chairman Powell News Conference. The ECB out with its own rate decision on Thursday. Plus, Apple earnings after the close. Fed speak back at the end of the week. Bullard Cook on Friday. Finally, payrolls as well to round out the week. The estimates so far, 180K. And coming up a little bit later, special coverage of the Federal Reserve decision. We'll be catching up with a whole group of fantastic guests, including the former Fed Vice Chair, Richard Clarida. From New York City, that does it for me. This is Bloomberg TV.